Orleans. This is a game that came out some time ago, was very successful, so the first edition sold out, and now I just got in the mail the second edition, and since I'd heard such good things about it, I wanted to give it a try as soon as possible. Tried, I did, and I can already anticipate to you that I really enjoyed this game. Orleans is a Eurogamer's Euro game. Uh, from point of view of mechanics and theme, it doesn't get any more Euro game than this. Uh, for the theme, we are in uh, medieval, early Renaissance France, and so you are developing your own little civilization. It's unclear who you are. You are a town, an entity. So you are uh, recruiting people to make more money. I guess you're sort of like a local lord, and you're trying to expand your political power, but most importantly, your economic power. You're trying to make money because money is good and nobody really dislikes it. Um, and for the point of view of the mechanics, also simple, straightforward, linear, clean mechanics that allow you to get resources which you use to invest uh, and get more resources, which you invest to get more resources, and so on and so forth, with a limited uh, random element. Let me show how the game works. Let's start with a general look at the play area. The board has it will look like when the game is set up. Here you have the game set up for two players. You have a main board here divided in two areas, one representing places where the players may travel and one representing various tracks that you use to check where you are at in various types of things. Here you have a board called the Beneficial Deeds, we'll talk about that later, and then each player also has a player's board. Very important, this area here is the marketplace or the market for your area. This is where you place your followers. In the game, the most important thing really, or well, what allows you to perform actions is followers represented by these tokens. These are nice, sturdy, thick tokens. This is tokens done right. And you will place your followers here, then later in the game you assign them to perform various tasks and that at that point you place them on this other part of your, <clears throat> of your player's board. Uh, you also have a baggie where you place your followers and that is where you will draw them from. Imagine this game as, I don't know, bingo with a theme, bingo for Euro gamers. Because basically you will purchase followers, you place them in here and then at the beginning of each turn you draw a bunch. At the beginning you start with four followers. Now there are generic followers that will acquire they acquire during the game and specific followers they're marked with your color. This is the merchant, the trader for the red player. And these never go away. There are various game effects that may affect the generic ones that you purchase during the game, but these ones always stay. Now a turn starts by drawing one of these tiles. There are 18 of them, so uh, there is one that is used each turn, so the stack also keeps track of the number of turns that you have played, and when the last tile is turned, that is the last turn, and then the game is over. And this tile here, as you can see, it has a lighter background, it's always the first tile. The general idea, however, is that at the beginning of each turn you flip the tile and you know the event that will need to be resolved. Some events, such as this one, affect the entire turn. For example, if the pilgrimage event is drawn, and that is always the first event in all games, uh, people cannot acquire monks that turn, that is the prohibition. The other ones are shuffled so they can come in any order. So in one turn maybe there will be taxes, you will have to pay coins, one per for every three goods that you have. More taxes, look at that. Plague, you will lose one of the followers from your bag, but you do not use your special ones. So trading day, then the trading post that you have generate money, this kind of thing. So there will be things coming out of the deck in a random order and you resolve an event from here each turn. Next, the player who is the most advanced on the farmer's track, we'll talk about that, gets a coin. The player that is the least advanced on that track has to pay a coin. And in a two-player game, then the player who is the most advanced still gets a coin, but the other player doesn't get to doesn't have to pay a coin. Then, very important, you get to draw from your follower's bag, yay, which is empty at the beginning of the game, so you only draw starting from turn two. 
Uh, there will be a bunch of guys here. At the beginning of the game you will draw four of them. You will place them in the market area of your of your board and that is and at that point the real main part of the turn really starts the main part of the turn is the planning phase when you move your guys from your market to this area here and then later you will activate you will use the places suppose that i want to use the village then i send a craftsman a boatman and a farmer and this little guy maybe i'll sit him here maybe i'll already commit him to perform an action for me next turn even though i don't have anything right now that would allow me to trigger an action with a single trader maybe i put it there at the beginning it's not very important but later on you may have a lot of people you can draw each turn so maybe you will not want people here and maybe you will want people sitting out there not doing much simply to manipulate the followers that you still have here to increase your chances of drawing certain certain guys so this is really the basic idea you will um, plan and everybody can plan at the same time and then players will resolve actions start with the first player you go around and you resolve actions one at a time until players do not have followers anymore everybody has used all of their actions so you can choose to pass you may have reserved an action and you may choose not to use it this turn so when everybody's done performing all the actions that they can or everybody has passed the turn is over and you move to the next turn repeating with an event uh, coin for the player with the most things um, uh, drawing etc etc the event from the tile usually is resolved at the end of the turn so if you see something like this you know that at the end of this turn the trading posts will pay off and maybe this turn you will want to build one so in most events you flip them face up you see what they will be but after they're resolved at the end of the turn so you can plan ahead and and figure out ways of dealing or maxi dealing with the negatives or maximizing the positives now as for the actions um actually you know what let's move on to the main thing but really to talk about the game we kind of need to switch between boards so here is the main board of the game and again this is the the players board now if i have these two guys here and i decide to activate the monastery action i remove the people that i have there and this is the standard thing to perform an action related to a place you need to have everybody that is necessary there you remove the tokens and you put them in your baggie to activate this action i need a scholar and a trader you don't have scholars to bring on the game I remove them and I grab a monk from the main board and I put the monk in my drawback. The monk is the wild card. It can be used to perform tasks that other people would perform. So that's neat. If I'm activating this action here with a farmer, craftsman and a trader, I get a scholar. So you can see, more specialized to do other stuff. This one allows me, these two guys together, give me a farmer. So I get a farmer in my draw bag. But also I can uh, advance my marker on this track here. Now let's have a closer look to see what it does. As you can see, when I advance on that, I also get a resource. When I get there, I will get some wheat. If I get here, cheese, wine, wool, brocade, and these are increasingly valuable resources. Well, incidentally, I forgot an important thing. I mentioned how you get the scholar, but there is another advantage. When you get the scholar, you get the scholar. It goes in your draw bag. You may draw him later. You also advance on this track. And that will allow you to advance that number of spaces on the development track, a sort of like population, technology, economy track. By getting that scholar, I advance by two points here, which gives me nothing right now. Suppose I get another scholar, I advance by three spaces there, one, two, three. Then I grab this guy, because I'm the first player to get there. Second player, sorry, you don't get the guy. This is a citizen, it is used for scoring purposes. Also, you see that I went past <clears throat> that thing. That is my level of development. <clears throat> it really doesn't do much 
for you during the game, well, there are cases where it does pay off, but in general, the most that it does is at the end of the game for score. Let's just say that the higher the level that you have, the higher your score at the end of the game. Also, if you get past one of these piles of coins, you will get the corresponding amount of money. So you will use this the scholar to advance on this track to improve your level, grab people and grab money. Uh, there are also other ways in which you will advance on this track, but the scholar is a very effective one. So as you can see, that's, that's why we have to switch between the player's board and this board, because what you do here gives you stuff, for example, gives you new people that will go in your drawback, but also allows you to perform actions and other interesting, cool things. If you get a craftsman from the village, the village with these three people, you can get a boatman, a craftsman, or a trader. If you do get a craftsman, then you get a craftsman, you guessed it. But you also advance on this track here, and as you can see from that symbol there, you get a technology. Technology tokens are really neat because they go on your board and you the first technology token that you have must replace a farmer basically they replace one of your workers and they simply provide that resource automatically so if i put a technology there for the rest of the game this thing never never goes away in order to activate the village you only need to put there a boatsman and a craftsman i do not need to worry about the farmer and again, the first has to be a farmer, the second technology on can cover any other symbol. So it's really neat to have a lot of technologies. Uh, some restrictions uh, are, are there in place. For example, if you have locations that only have one place, you cannot cover it with the technology, you cannot turn it into a completely automatic uh, resource mill and you can only have one technology per place, so this would be highly illegal. But technologies are pretty sweet, and when you get a craftsman, on top of getting the craftsman in your bag, you also get a technology. These people are the tradesmen, you guessed it. If you activate the village, remove your people, you get one of these guys in your draw bag, your draw bag, and you advance on this track here, which gives you a location, an actual location, you're expanding your town. There are two stacks of locations. One is marked with the number one on the back and also actually in front. And then another stack is marked with the number two, both in the back and in front. Simply put, the first time that you get a look, new location, it has to be from the one stack. Later, you can choose between the one and the two. You simply choose one of the tiles and you place it by your player's board and it becomes a new place that you can activate. Some of these are super intuitive because they simply produce resources. For example, if I acquired this new location using that action, then later if I place two farmers here, when I remove them to activate the location, I get a cheese. There are several types of, of products that you can acquire. So I get the cheese. Here I get the brocade, which is worth a lot of points at the end. Here with two craftsmen I can get money and development from that is advancing on the development craft. Single farmer gets me wheat. Single monk getting drunk in the monastery gives me, uh, gives me two coins thanks to the brewery. Hospital can generate money based on level of development, this kind of thing. There are also um, interesting other actions. For example, this allows me to use a boatman as any of these other guys. There are a couple of these flexible things. There's one that increases the number of uh, of draw of tiles that you can draw of followers that you can draw like this one you can with this with the bathhouse you can draw two and then keep one put one back so it's an extra follower each turn this is super mighty so this is what you do thanks to the merchant you get new people so we covered some of these things that give you extra people this one gives you a knight, so you get a knight in your bag, 
and also advance on this track which increases the number of followers that you can draw each turn you start by following by drawing four followers each turn you can draw more thanks to the knights and also knights can then be used to trigger some of these actions a knight and a scholar used as an action allow you to get a point uh, advanced by one space in the in that in the advancement track these ship Wagon allow you to move on this other part of the board. There's this map here and you start in the location indicated there. These resource tiles are placed there randomly at the beginning of the game and simply by using the ship action you can move through a waterway from one location to the other and you grab the resource that you encountered along the way if you use the wagon action then you can move by your road and also you grab the corresponding resource that was on the connection that you just traveled through this other action here is the guild hall by placing these three guys here you can place a guild hall uh, trading post these guys in the location where you are so for example I spent, I used that action and I put one there. Important, they can only be one of these uh, for each location. And again, these are good for scoring. Some actions coming from the tiles, uh, some special events uh, will trigger stuff, but most of what these are important for is for scoring. So that tells you most of the actions here with the exception of this one. You can place one or two guys here and it can be anything. And then the action when you're activating the town hall is to remove them from here and to put them on this other board. Again, very bingo-like. You're trying to build some combos here, uh, turn after turn. You put the marker that you retired uh, in a corresponding space. Monks go here or here, anywhere you see a monk, farmers, knights. There's a way, of course, to thin out uh, uh, characters that you may not need later in the game to improve your chances of getting some of the characters that you want out of your bag. Also, when you put a character on this board, stays there for the rest of the game, is not yours anymore, and it gives you the, be the corresponding benefit. Putting a knight here gives me two coins, putting a traitor here, two coins, putting anything, one of these characters here gives me a coin or a point on the development track that is a movement on the development track, three coins, etc. Here, in these spaces, there will also be citizens there. You don't see them there right now because I'm holding the board vertical. But there will be citizens there. The player that completes an area grabs the citizen and puts it in their play area. And, well, again, that means that you need to be the one that does that. You may have placed everybody but one, and then somebody else places the remaining one. They get the person, if they are the first person to go there, uh, to complete the area. That is one of the few things in the game which is fully competitive and not, uh, and not uh, multiplayer solo. Of course, these resources also uh, are picked up by the players as they move, so there's also... A competitive factor there you remember can only have one trading post per area so that also is competitive first player that gets there uh, builds a guild hall and that is it and this is pretty much uh, the game I mean uh, this is how it works you go through the game for 18 turns drawing stuff from here collecting resources getting more followers in your bag triggering actions that will allow you to get more stuff, get people, develop your development track. There's also money, you gain money, which you need because sometimes uh, you're gonna be taxed and then money is good, victory points at the end of the game. And at the end of the game, after 18 turns, you score points and there is this uh, scoring tile here, this convenient player aid. Oh, here is the turn track. And this tells you how much things are worth at the end of the game. This is how each resource, how much each resource is worth. Wine is three victory points. Brocade is five victory points. Each coin is a single victory point. Here you have the multiplier stuff. Each guild hall that you have and each citizen that you have 
is worth number of points equal to your level of development. So if I have a development of say five, then each citizen is worth five points and each guild hall that I have also is worth five points. You total all the points that you may have collected from all sources in the game and at that point the player with the highest score is the winner of the game. So at first sight it really to me looked like bingo with a theme, bingo for Eurogamers and that doesn't have to be a bad thing. Um, the random element comes from the drawing and that's really the only major random element. You may say that the placement of the resources on the map where you travel at the beginning of the game is random but it affects all players in the same way so it is just random setup as opposed to something that dynamically enters the game. Um, but the one element that is in the game, of course, is drawing people from your back. But what I really like is there are so many ways of manipulating your odds, of, of increasing your chances of getting what you want and getting some combos out from retiring your people or simply letting people sit on your board uh, without sending them back to the bag. So early on in the game your bag is empty and you're trying to get as many people in there as possible but there is of course a fine line between having enough people, not enough people and too many people. So there are two fine lines and you're trying to walk in, in between these two abysses of inefficiency. So I really like that constant, getting people in, getting to improve your resources and then trying to figure out when it is that your engine is becoming too big for its own good and you start thinning things out. Uh, so many paths to victory, um, you may produce a lot of stuff using new locations, say the cheese factory, the tailor shop, you're creating resources out of thin air thanks to the locations that you have, or you're grabbing resources from the map. Um, many ways you can go about, about getting points, uh, the development track. So you have kind of like, of course, long-term and short-term objectives that you can work towards. The long-term is getting a lot of guild halls out and getting a good, in a good position on the development, so you have that multiplier at the end of the game. The short-term is grab stuff. And I really like, actually, come to think of it, there's another random element, which is the tiles, the event tiles that are drawn at the beginning of each turn. That is random too. But you also know exactly what is there. When you become, once you become familiar with the game, if taxa taxation hasn't hit yet, then you know that there will be a lot of money that you need to pay. Taxation is the event that gets money out of your purse based on how many resources you have. But that Again, random element, you don't know the order in which the tiles will come out, still uh, is something you can factor in your strategy because if taxation comes out early on, then you know you can stock up on goods and you will not have to pay too much money based on that. Um, and same things, if uh, some tiles that will make the development track rewarding came out early, then you know that those tiles will not score as many points, will not give you as many resources as they would if they stay in the, in the deck for longer and you're able to build on that track and then you can take advantage of those. So. Uh, Random elements are limited and that is good, Eurogamers will like that. If anything, and this may be the word gamer in me, uh, I'm toying with the idea of playing with the locations, the, one, the ones that you can buy and then use, uh, and you can choose to get them. I'm toying with the idea of randomizing them. What if you were to shuffle the ones in stack one and stack two, and then when it is time to acquire a new resource, you draw two from a stack and you choose one to keep and one that you return to the stack. Uh, I'm wondering, I like, I kind of like that idea. I guess that uh, the, one of the dangers of the game may be that after a while players may get enamored with certain synergies, certain strategies, and you know that player A is always going to go for that combo thing. So, uh, the game actually gives you uh, an optional rule for experienced players, which is uh, a rule that allows you to remove tiles from the beginning of the game. I know you're going for that strategy, then I'm removing that tile, which is not going to be part of this game, and the opponent can do the same. So, not all tiles uh, with locations are used in all games. 
you can use that, but I like the idea, I like to try, I don't know if somebody did, to, to randomize the locations, which also would prevent the, the problem of players showing to the game with algorithms in, in their mind already that they built at home. Um, I kind of like the idea in all games that they play over having to react to unpredictable events. But as is, the random factor is really limited. The one that is there you can affect uh, with your strategy, you can affect with good decisions. And it has to me, this game has two of the things that I like the most in games, which is multiple paths to victory, at least this I like in, in non-war games, where games may have a single path and still be nice. But with Euro games, it's better if you have multiple ways to go about things. Another thing that I like is abundance of possible actions and the grueling, grueling feeling that you have uh, from not being able to exploit them all. So a lot of options, a lot of possibilities, and you always want some extra actions so that you know that the actions that you take count matter because you have a limited number of those. At the same time, this is not one of those games where you have such few actions that to mess once will simply destroy your chances of winning the game. If you mess once, if you mess twice, if you do not use some action correctly, uh, it's not that then uh, there are so few actions in the game that you'll never be able to catch up that a single uh, misplayed action will throw you out of the, of the race. Uh, I think that actually you have a really nice balance here, just enough actions to allow you to do something every turn, something interesting, more interesting depends on where you stand, but you always will be able to do something and at the same time you still will want for more, so you'll be planning uh, ahead on the ways you can get uh, further actions later. I liked it, I liked it very much. It is a game that uh, is pretty simple. I mean, the entire idea is grab people, uh, draw them from the back, use them to perform actions. Of course, you need to learn those actions, but it's not a game that really takes all that long to learn. It's not hard to grasp, there isn't any complex concept, but strategy can be pretty deep and multi-layered. And if you're playing with more than two players, then it can get competitive, like the interaction can be tough because resources are limited. And with a higher number of players, of course, the competition to um, the to gain resources will be uh, more interesting and more dramatic. Orleans, I heard good things about this game and I think that the good things that I heard are perfectly based on reality because I definitely enjoyed this game. I think it's an excellent game. It has to be one of my favorite non-war games for 2015. Uh, high on the scale way up there together with Marco Polo which is this game which somehow also reminds me of Orleans a little bit. In Marco Polo also you have a board where you travel and you have an allocation of resources. In Marco Polo is done with dice and then you have to place on various locations instead of people that come out of the back but also in Marco Polo you have that idea of building an engine having random resources and uh, choosing those to get more resources or travel on a board. Orleans and Marco Polo, two of the best uh, non-war games of 2015, but back to the one we were talking about mainly. Orleans, really, really good game.